Let that be a reminder we need to shut our devices off. <laughs> uh, good evening. Welcome to An Evening with Mike Hill, hosted by Marietta College and Campus Marshes Museum. Special thanks to the Marietta College Office of Alumni Engagement, the Marietta College Career Center, and the Legacy Library for sponsoring this event. I'm Douglas Anderson. I'm recently re retired as director of the library here at Marietta College. I well remember Mike Hill's first visit to Marietta College in August of 2016. Like any other experienced researcher, he had called ahead to speak to someone in Special Collections about possible resources for research. And it was evident that he had already done his homework, reviewing the website, uh, the finding aids on our Special Collections website for our, our different uh, collections. We were aware that he was working with David McCullough on a book idea relating to early Marietta, and that his goal was to determine, determine whether our collections contained enough material to support the book project that they had in mind. He spent a week here on that first visit, and I understand that on, uh, after his first day of working with Linda Showalter, he called Mr. McCullough to update him on what he had found, and let him know that our resources would do what they needed. Needless to say, that research culminated in the publication of The Pioneers, the heroic story of the settlers who brought the American ideal west on May 7, 2019, so three years later. Over those three years, Mike made more than 10 extended visits here to work in special collections, several of them alongside Mr. McCullough, and I think that's enough for us to claim him as one of us. In his 40 years of work as a historical researcher, Mike has worked with a long list of authors that you'll recognize some. His work uh, with McCullough is well known, but he is, has also worked with John Meacham, Sebastian Junger, Nathaniel Philbrick, Evan Thomas, Michael Corda, Senator John McCain, James Bradley, Susan Eisenhower, Michael Bischloss, and Caroline Kennedy. He's also been involved in several well-known television series, including as co-producer of Space Shuttle Disaster. Mike is also a published author in his own right. His most recent book is Funny Business, The Legendary Life and Political Satire of Art Bookwald, published this year by Random House. Earlier books include War Poet, The Life of Alan Seeger, and his Rendezvous with Death, published in 2017, and Elihu Washburn, the Diary and Letters of America's Minister to France During the Siege in Commune of Paris, published in 2012. A native of Pennsylvania, Mike graduated from Kent State University as a political science major, went on to receive a law degree from the University of Akron, and then a master's in public administration from Harvard's John F. Kennedy School of Government. Uh, after his schooling, uh, Hill served as a press aide for then Vice President Walter Mondale. We're pleased to have Mike with us this evening. He will be interviewed by Professor Matt Young of the Marietta College History Department. We will take some time at the end of the, uh, quest, the, the interview for questions from the audience, so get your questions ready. So let's welcome Matt and Mike to the stage. Uh, so Mike, before we get started, you had said that you wanted to say a, a few words here. Yeah, if, if I can, Matt. Uh, uh, okay. uh oh. Maybe we have to get a little closer. How's that? Is that better? No? Is this better? Is that better? No. no. Not, yes. not even close. <laughs> Maybe it needs. Is that any any better? Or do you want to Does this work? Yeah. 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 Excuse me, how's that? Is that good? Yeah. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Um, 
Thanks, Matt. And Doug, thank you so much for that very, very kind introduction. And I just want to, just before we get the conversation rolling, I just wanted to thank all of you for being here tonight, for coming out tonight uh, to participate in this, what really is a tribute uh, to the life and work of uh, David McCullough and, uh, and his wife, Rosalie McCullough. Um, and it's great that you're here for this, this tribute. Um, David was, as many of you know, he was an extraordinary man who led an extraordinary life. Um, and his work um, and the aspirations that he had for history and uh, good history in this country uh, influenced and touched uh, so many people which is part of the reason that with his passing that he was missed by so many people. Um, he, was, uh, he was so loved by so many and his work uh, will live on and um, this event tonight is part of uh, trying to carry on his legacy. And so I'm so grateful uh, myself and behalf of uh, David and Rosalie's family that you've taken the time to be here tonight. So I'm very, very thankful for that. I appreciate it. Great, Mike, thank you. Um, I thought maybe you could kind of get us started talking a little bit about your own background, but more, maybe more specifically, how you got started working with, with David. Sure, uh, it was, uh, I was working, as Doug mentioned, I was working up on Capitol Hill as a uh, press secretary for a congressman. And I had gotten to a point where I was just, I was really kind of burned out with politics. I wanted to do something else. And so I had always been interested in history. And so I had, uh, in the midst of trying to figure out what I wanted to do, I read two of David's books, uh, Mornings on Horseback and The Great Bridge, about the building of the Brooklyn Bridge. And I thought, you know, um, uh, if I could help somebody like this, do research on his books. It would be the greatest thing ever. So I found out that he lived on Martha's Vineyard and I was in Washington near Library of Congress and the archives and so forth. So I basically wrote him a letter and offered to do research uh, for him. And I sent it off, figured I would never hear anything. And then about a month later, I got a wonderful letter back from him uh, saying that he was moving to Washington with his family to work on the Harry Truman biography. And he said, give me a call at the office and, and we'll talk about it. So we met for lunch and we had a wonderful lunch uh, from the get-go. And so he started giving me some assignments to do, um, very targeted assignments, looking at collections and so forth. And so I would go off and then work on those and then every couple of weeks, I would go over to his house and we would have kind of a a college tutorial where he would, I would present to him what I'd done and he would critique it and he would ask follow-up questions and so forth. And so we would do that and then he'd say pursue this or look at this collection or whatever. So um, uh, we'd do that every couple of weeks and then over about the next year and a half, uh, we just developed this really wonderful uh, relationship that went on for over 40 years. And, uh, it was, it was without a doubt one of the great joys. And it's a, it's a lesson that, that uh, you know, send that letter, make that call if, you're, if you, you wanna, because you never know what spark's gonna come out of it. And that changed my life uh, dramatically in a trajectory I never would have imagined and uh, to such wonder, <coughs> wonderment. And then you continue to work with him then? Yes, for, yes, exactly. Right. So, uh, the Harry Truman book was the first book, and then I helped him uh, all the way through Pioneers. Mm -hmm. Yeah, mm -hmm. exactly. Mm -hmm. uh, one of the things I was, I guess, maybe most surprised by, having you know worked a, a little bit, kind of did my bit um, as as you were working on the Pioneers, is discovering um, uh, how David his method essentially uh, in in research and, and writing. Um, I was a little surprised, um, but I, perhaps you could you could talk about uh, his approach. Oh, sh oh, sure. Uh, 
Well, the first, and Doug again touched on it a little bit, is that is that the, the first key was to come up with a topic or a perspective topic and then find out what, what's out there in terms of archival material and, and other. Linda Showalter is incredible. Bill Reynolds is incredible. Scott Britton is here. Ray Zwick. So many people here who were so part, so much a part of making that book happen. Um, so the archival material we knew right away was there. It's extraordinary. The collection at Special Collections Department at Marriott is, uh, College is, is extraordinary. So we knew the archival material in terms of tangible artifacts and so forth. We knew Campus Martius, that those were there. Uh, some of the other historic sites, excuse me, were, were, uh, were still here. Uh, the newspapers we knew were here, which is another component, as you know, of a good historical book. Um, the paintings, uh, David was always a, a firm believer in, in finding paintings or engravings that were either done contemporaneously or depicted a contemporaneous scene so that he, again, visually um, could see what a scene or what a person looked like or what they dressed like, uh, just as importantly. So paintings were, were important. Um, and then the other component, which I talked a little bit about with some of the students today, is that David, in addition to being an incredible writer and speaker and so forth, was also an artist. And one thing that he would always do is he wanted to, if he could see the sites, the actual place where an event took place, he wanted to set his eyes on it. And one thing that he used to do when we were in Marietta is we would stay uh, down at the Lafayette Hotel. And he'd go out before sunrise and look at the Ohio River because he wanted to see from an artist's eyes how the light hit that river so that when he described the Ohio River, he could have in his mind's eye how that looked. And he would do the same at sunset and uh, in different forms of weather and so forth. So it, it, it's this gathering of, of the archival material, what's, uh, what's in existence and so forth, and then having incredible, incredible historians and, and uh, archivists uh, help out along the way. And, and uh, he, he said often that he thought the help that he got here in the collections and so forth were probably some of the best that he ever had to work with during his entire career. I'm thinking also, he, he didn't use a, a computer. He didn't use the internet uh, to do the research that he did. He, my understanding is that he used the, to do his writing, he used the manual typewriter that yes, he exactly. started out using in the <laughs> late 1960s yep, when he yep. began writing. He had a manual typewriter. He used it up until the, the very last book, the very last, last page. And, um, and I thought it was just wonderful. It was, it was great, but um, we talked a little bit about it today is that I think it was that, and this is my opinion, that I don't think he if he, 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 if he had wanted to, he couldn't have adjusted to a computer for his writing because I think what happened after time was that the, the, uh, uh, the tangible touch of the typewriter keys became part of his creative process. And so he needed that in order to do what he wanted to do. And so uh, I think uh, it, it was wonderful. And I, I can remember times of being up uh, wherever he happened to be and outside the office working on something, whatever, and just hearing the clattering of the typewriter. And it was just the most wonderful, wonderful thing. So yes, he did that his whole life. When you work out an effective approach, right, um, then you, you stick with it, right? Yes, um, exactly, right. exactly. Um, I wondered if you would comment a little bit about the, the how did he choose a, a book topic? What, what kind of process did he go through and sort of, you know, the, when you look at the 11 books that he wrote, um, cover a, a wide range of different Time periods and uh, you know different different types of people. Yes, he the one thing he said in terms in in general, Matt was that he uh, 
he always wanted to choose a subject that he didn't know that much about because that was part of the joy of the journey of the research and to find out about new characters or, uh, or as in pioneers of the new settlement or Americans in Paris and so forth. He didn't, he didn't want to take on a subject that he knew much about because he, he loved that. It varied from uh, time to time and sometimes he changed uh, after, after doing research on a project. Uh, the, the examples that come to mind is that um, before he did Harry Truman, he was actually uh, going to do a biography of uh, Pablo Picasso. And he actually spent, I think, about a year, maybe more, doing research and so forth. And one day, he, he said he just realized that he couldn't spend another day <laughs> writing that because he didn't like him. <laughs> and he didn't want to spend another couple of years working on a subject of something he didn't like. And as many of you know, or all of you know, that his subjects um, that he has chosen are people that he really admired for a whole variety of reasons. And I think, I think a couple of the things that he would, he would always talk about was that characters that exemplified the best aspects of the American character, determination, overcoming adversity. Uh, and so that, that would figure into the process. And of course, the Pioneers is a perfect example of those, of those lessons of of adventures, determination, trying to do something for their country, and overcoming adversity mm -hmm. in, in, uh, in, in part of it. Um, the other one that did change was that with John Adams, he originally was going to do a dual biography of John Adams and Thomas Jefferson. Yeah, I was going to ask you about yeah. that, actually, because I, I seem to remember him talking about that. And that was, he wasn't, the, the, the original concept was to do a dual biography, but as he started working on Jefferson, I yeah. think, am, am I mistaking that, that he didn't uh, necessarily take a, a shine to Thomas Jefferson? Yeah, right? there were two, right, there were two dynamics in there, as, as I recall. One was the fact that, that uh, yes, that, that as John and Abigail's stock went up as he was researching <laughs> Jefferson's, he was dropping a bit. Um, and then, and then um, as, also as part of that too was the fact that he, he picked up pretty quickly how important Abigail was gonna be a character in the book and the relationship between those two and how essential and important um, that she was. So it, it then shifted away from the dual biography to more the dual biography of John and Abigail. And Jefferson, of course, was a character with some of the others in that. But that was another, and that's a, that's a really good example, uh, Matt, about how, you know, and I'm sure a lot, uh, many, if not all, historians or writers uh, do that, is that you have one concept and then you make your adjustments along the way either because of the material or because of your passions that you develop about the material. Mm -hmm. It does make me wonder, though, about the, the issue of objectivity, right, as historians, uh, that, I mean, obviously, if we identified with our subject, I, I would assume we wouldn't have biographies of Pablo Picasso or much less Hitler or Stalin, right, which I, you know, I think we would all agree are, are necessary and important. Um, did, did McCullough, did he talk about that, uh, you know, with you at all in terms of admiring the subject, but at the same time maintaining some some distance in order to be objective and, and make those kinds of judgments? Yes, he he did, and and um, and he, uh, you know, I'm thinking both of, of, in terms of Truman and and John Adams and so forth. I mean, if you read the books carefully, where the you know when there were warts. He pointed them out. So these weren't these weren't uh, glowing uh, biographies and, and and so forth. But he did, you know. Again, he didn't want to write something about somebody he, he didn't totally like, like Picasso, but he admired. But he was not. He he would point point out the flaws, the failures, and the foibles or whatever of of, of the characters when it was necessary uh, to do it. Um, I, I remember with the Truman book. I think the the loyalty oath issue was was mm -hmm. a was a was a big issue, mm -hmm. and, and he he.
dealt with that. Uh, the, it was John Adams, the quasi war, and that was kind of the driving force, which of course nobody did, so sure. But it does seem to be the arc that is, I think, about sort of all, you know, his entire, the, his works. They engage American subjects. It's interesting that to hear that, you know, this Picasso biography is the thing that he kind of started and he kind of dipped his toe in the water and he, he didn't pursue. But that these were, you know, this is essentially a, a, a series on various facets of American history. Yes. And, and the, other, the other thing, too, is that um, I remember him saying one time that, that I think it was his daughter, Dory, who asked him, uh, uh, or they, not asked, but I think had a discussion about what unifying thread was through his, right. his, his books. And he, he said that um, uh, Americans overcoming adversity. And I think if you really look at uh, whether it's adversity in terms of, 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 of background, of childhood or whatever, or the course of, of events that they had to deal with and so forth, that I think that those, you know, if you look at the Brooklyn Bridge, the, the building of the Panama Canal, mm -hmm. the Johnstown Flood, uh, the pioneers. I mean, they're all all there. So I think that that, yes, that's that's a real unifying effect mm -hmm. or uh, theme. Can we talk about the pioneers a little bit then? Sort of in his no. last. <laughs> <laughs> we won't go there. I'm not here to talk. About that. <laughs> of course. Uh, the, you know that the fact that this was his 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 final project. Um, uh, you know, where does it fit, I guess, in sort of the, in a, and you've said wonderful things about um, working here and, and having the opportunity to kind of work in, the, in, in our special collections and, and deal with this topic. Um, this is a little bit of a, I guess, um, this is not a topic which is commonly uh, treated in a lot of popular history. Uh, and I wondered if, you know, he, did that figure into his uh, approach at all, and he's thinking about this topic and, and pursuing it? Meaning, um, you know, obviously he's a a, a, a a popular author, a best-selling author, a Pulitzer Prize winner. Um, but there are certain topics, obviously, I think that you would think of an audience is going to really latch on to. I mean, did he did he see that in in the pioneers? Was that some concern here that that he wouldn't have the audience for this book? Uh, no, uh, and, and, and I'd like to answer that in two ways, is that um, it dawned on me when, when uh, we were making arrangements for me to come out here that um, the, you all, the town of Marietta, Marietta College, the students and all the people who live here have a singular distinction that no other place in the universe no other college anywhere can claim, which is this is the place, this is the college, this is the special collection where David McCullough, the great American treasure historian, two-time Pulitzer Prize winning author, did his last book, researched and did his last book. Nobody else can claim that but you. And I think that's a wonderful uh, thing to be said and I think that's part of why he, held this town and the people here and so forth in, in such high esteem. To, to go to your question, Matt, I think, uh, no, I, it, it, that never came up in anything. As a matter of fact, I think the fact that it really hadn't been done before was, was part of the appeal for him to do it because it was, even though, you know, there had been some work done, done on it, various aspects of it, I think the fact that it hadn't been done was a, was 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 of great appeal to him, and I think that that was what uh, was the deciding factor. I don't think the other was was a much concern. Yeah, I am curious though that this was his final project. What I didn't get the impression that that was sort of his last book when he came right. and, you know, and talked about it. Sort of, of course, you know, what was he what was he envisioning sort of after after the pioneer? What was, he, what was he thinking about? What was he working on? You know, that's a good question. Uh, and I have no idea. And I don't think, he never really discussed it. I, I don't think he joking did. about um, 
not wanting to get into tennis. I, I remember that and, and kind of thinking about, you know, the, the idea of retirement wasn't, uh, right. Right. Oh, <laughs> wasn't oh, interesting oh. to him at all. Oh, never. Ab absolutely. I, I mean, the one thing that, that uh, anybody who knows or worked with David and, 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 and Rosalie was the fact that, that they were always on the go. There was always something going on, something happened. Either David was, was working on a book, he was thinking about a new book, he was, he was giving speeches around the country about, about the importance of history and historical uh, uh, literacy. He was, he was promoting a cause like the Disney fight in Virginia when they wanted to build, build a theme park. He was working on a documentary, he was helping out with a feature film or whatever. There was always, always something going. There was never a break in the action. And, um, and that was part of the, 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 really the joy of being along for the ride was that it was just constant and it was always different. It was always new. Um, somebody, uh, uh, did you ask today what, oh no, uh, uh, Linda did, if, if I, of all David's books, if I had a particular favorite. Yeah. And, I, of course, I, every one that I worked on, I, I love. But the one that, if I was pressed, was his book, The Greater Journey, about Americans going to Paris in the 19th century. And by Americans, I mean, you know, the medical students, the, the, the artists, the writers, uh, the politicians. Uh, and um, it, it was my favorite for me personally because there were so many of these these characters that I didn't know anything about, and so it was a real journey of discovery for me. Uh, like I said today, I knew John S Singer Sargent, but I didn't know the genius that John Singer Sargent or Augustus St. God was. I probably didn't even know his name at that point. So it was a real journey. But then um, uh, uh, David's son Bill and I were talking uh, one day and about this, and I said that that was my favorite book, and he said. Mine too, because it, it really, in a subtle way, was a, a autobiographical book of David's interests in so many different things, in art, in music, in history. Uh, and and um, so, but that's, a, I, I, I have no idea, Matt, because the, it, it, there was never a discussion of mm -hmm. it. Mm -hmm. uh, what about David's favorite? What was his, you know, did he, did he have a particularly favorite? Uh, or one that he thought was the most important, or or had a you know the most significant impact. I don't think he ever. I can't recall if he did say it. I I don't recall it. Um, I don't recall it. I, I I do know when the American Spirit book came out mm -hmm. late, which was a compilation of speeches mm -hmm. and articles that he gave and so forth. Just because of what was going on in the country and the tenor of the times, he was he was very very proud of that book coming out because it was it was he thought it was it was essential that a book like that come out to remind Americans of a lot of the themes about the the good parts of the American character that he had always always believed in, but I think it was also a wonderful way as a testament to what his beliefs and so forth to get out there. So I know he was particularly proud of that, mm -hmm. um, but the other part of it, I don't remember him ever saying mm -hmm. that he did. Did he, did he talk to you uh, much about sort of his take on the, the, the divisiveness in, in American society, sort of this you know, growing divide that we see? He, he, was, he, was, uh, uh, he was troubled by it, he was dismayed by it. Yeah, absolutely, and I think that's that ties back into why I think the American Spirit book that he that he was particularly proud of that coming out at that time mm -hmm. because it was able for him to to offer his his you know let's take a step back you know we've been through this country has been through difficult times before through adversities and so forth and we've always survived and that that this that that book was able to say take a step back take stock of our great qualities and so forth, and we'll get through this, mm -hmm. despite the fact that it is troubling times. Mm -hmm. Can you elaborate further on how you would characterize the impact that David McCullough had on 
sort of a, a American collective memory or, or social memory, sort of the, you know, the way that we, we think about our, our history? Yeah, I think, uh, I think he, again, his, his books and what they try to portray and convey of these various parts of the American character, um, I think was, was at, at the heart of it. Um, but beyond that, and I touched on this a little bit before, was that uh, he was very, very concerned about uh, that we need, to, we need to be more aware of our history, our, our country's history. And I think that that's, that's why he wrote about these various su subjects and so forth. But I think he, he felt, <clears throat> excuse me, that we needed to uh, teach history better in, uh, in high schools and junior high and so forth. And also we needed to, he always would talk about that not every college or university requires a history requirement anymore. He felt it was very important that we do that. And I'm very impressed, and he was always very impressed, by the way, with, with the faculty at, at, uh, at uh, Marietta College here. But I think he, uh, he used to talk about, uh, you know, describe it as spreading the gospel of history. And, and, um, and so he would say that, uh, he would talk about that in a lot of his speeches about the need for promoting history and the need for parents to be engaged in that whole process too, of taking, you know, taking their young children out to historic sites uh, like the Campus Martius or so, so forth or Gettysburg or whatever to see real history and to try and get them engaged uh, that way. So um, he, he was, aside from just his, his work, he was very concerned about the larger issue mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. of, uh, of uh, understanding and, and uh, studying history. Mm -hmm. And so thinking about then, this is really sort of, we, we access the past through text, right? Through, through reading a, an engaging narrative uh, that, you know, obviously David was very talented at, at creating. I'm just kind of curious, going back to the John Adams biography, which then was turned into a series, an HBO series. What was his thought about that and, and the way that, um, I have an interest in sort of history and film, uh, and so the way then the historical narratives then get uh, translated into visual media. Um, what was his thought about the way that the, the book was adapted for, for, for screen? Great, great question. He absolutely, absolutely was so enthusiastic about it, embraced it for a whole variety of reasons. Uh, he, uh, one is the fact that, that, that um, uh, by taking his book and going to the screen, it was gonna bring that subject to a wider audience, mm -hmm. which again is part of this about, about history. But the other thing was that he, from very early on, uh, he, he, was, he had a meeting with Tom Hanks uh, when there was discussions about, about him uh, uh, buying the rights to the book. And they had a meeting, uh, David and Mr. Hanks had a meeting. And I remember David saying to me that Mr. Hanks came into the meeting and he had a copy of, of John Adams and it had all these tabs out there. And when David saw that, he knew that he had read it and studied it. And he said during the course of that conversation, he was convinced that Tom Hanks was, gonna, was the guy to do it, and he was gonna do his best to make sure that his book and the spirit of his book was conveyed. And I, I know that when they were, when they were uh, producing the film, I spent some time on the set, and the detail that they, to make that an authentic uh, series was incredible. I mean, they, they I remember at one point that um, there's, a, there's a part in there about the Boston Massacre, and they show the scene where the British soldiers uh, 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 came in. And the set design people wanted to make sure that the buttons on the, on the, the coats of the, of the um, uh, Sons of Liberty and also the British soldiers, that they were exactly the way that they were supposed to be. The, the, what they did in terms of the room where the uh, uh, Declaration of Independence was debated and, and so forth was incredible. They would, They'd have, they'd have some of the 
actors writing letters during some of the debate with quill pins and ink and so forth, and they made sure that the actors had, had ink on their fingers to show that they were actually, <laughs> instead of just doing that. It was incredible, and so he was, he was, he embraced it, but he was, more than that, he was absolutely enthusiastic yeah. about it. He was yeah. thrilled with the way it came but out. But then, you know, obviously getting the details right, uh, filmmakers oftentimes are notoriously good at getting the buttons right, but then missing sort of the larger kinds of, you know, <laughs> the, the McCullough was pleased with yes. the way that it was sort of true to exactly. the biography that exactly. he'd written. Uh, yes, okay. very much so. Yeah. yeah. Um, what about then, what was McCullough's take on um, the differences between popular history and, and academic history then, kind of moving in a, in a different direction? Sure, sure. Um, he, he, uh, he embraced both. I mean, he, his, his view was uh, that um, it, it was a big tent philosophy to history, that, that uh, popular historians and academic historians uh, are all essential. Again, if you if you if you keep in mind the fact that his his overriding goal was was get history out there, get people interested in, it, get people reading, regardless of whether you're you're an academic or you're or you're just a, an ordinary reader and so forth. So he he very much embraced both of them. And as a matter of fact, I, I know for I, I know that uh, many many of the projects that he was working on that he would be reading a secondary source for one of the books he was working on, and he would see um, lists of some academic articles in the back on specific subjects or, or whatever, and he would say to me, we gotta make sure that we get this. And they'd be in these, you know, some obscure academic magazines, so but he'd say, we gotta get that because I gotta see what's in there to make sure that I'm, you know, keeping my focus right and so forth. Um, so he, would, he was, uh, he was very much in favor of a big tent, and mm -hmm. the more the better. Well, you we were talking earlier, though, of the interaction that you had also with Gordon Wood, the revolutionary era historian as well, who seemed to be receptive to kind of this this yes. big tent kind of approach. Yes, <laughs> yes, in an to, interview to that he, he was asked that question mm -hmm. that you asked me, and he basically said the same thing. He said, he said, you know, the more the better. I think it's wonderful to have uh, uh, academic uh, historians, and the in the popular historians, uh, what they do is that they, you know, with David's David's book, is that they're able to expand, you know, people's interest mm -hmm. and enjoyment mm -hmm. of history, which is the which is uh, which is the key. So, um, yeah, right. Which also makes sense, I think, in terms of the way that he seemed to uh, focus on biographies as well, as a way of, I think, that there's that kind of human interest that, that kind of you know, compels the, the reader, um, brings them in to the, right. to the story. Right. Um, could you talk a little bit uh, about, we had talked earlier, I'm thinking back uh, to 2019 when the Pioneers came out and the, um, the event that took place here at uh, Marietta in, in uh, the People's Bank Theater, which was, yeah. which was packed uh, oh, to yeah. the yeah. gills, if, my, if I remember correctly. I mean, there was yeah. a huge turnout there. Yeah. That was a wonderful evening. I'm sure a lot of us were, were there and, and remember that. Um, and just getting to hear David uh, talk about the book. Um, here was a, a fellow who was in his 80s at that point. I remember the sort of table and chairs set up on the, the stage and he didn't sit down once, I think, in two hours, sort of walking around and just, you know, it was really a wonderful, wonderful um, evening. Um, but you had said that that was important to him as well, that not just to the community that got to come and sort of celebrate the, the book, but that this was an important event for, for him and for his, his family. Exactly. Well, two, two things on that is, is uh, one thing which we were talking about uh, uh, today was that um, his energy level was incredible. I mean, I, it was just, I mean, he would, it, it was incredible because he was just so excited about, mm -hmm. about um, what he was doing. And uh, I remember this great story. When he, when, uh, he was working on the Wright brothers, uh, he and Rosalie and I went over to 
Paris to go down to Le Mans to see where the Wright brothers did their first big test there to prove that what they were working on was actually accurate. So we were we were had gotten into Paris and we were going down to Le Mans the next morning. So that night, um, I uh, you know I said, "What time do you want to meet downstairs?" He said, "Oh, why don't we why don't we meet?" Uh, the train, I think it was like 9.30 or something like that. And he said, well, why don't we meet downstairs about, about 7.30 and we'll have a little coffee and then we'll get together. And I said, oh, that's great. So of course, 6 a.m. arrives, my phone rings in my hotel room and it's David and he goes, I know it's a little bit early, but I'm so excited to go down to Le Mans. I'm, Rosalie and I are downstairs here. Why don't you come down and join us for some coffee? And of course I said, I'll be down as soon as I can. But anyway, but that's just a perfect example. And the, the other example was that him getting up in the morning and going out and looking at the Ohio River here today. I mean, it was such a beautiful thing that he, he would do that. Um, but the, the, the final, uh, that final time when he and his family, and it was not only he and Rosalie, uh, but his children and uh, many of the grandchildren, and it, I think one grandchild were here. And we had wrapped up the, um, the, the events here, and um, he had put together a big party for the family and so forth down at the Lafayette. And it was one of the most glorious times because it was, as any occasion with the McCullough family always was, was that it would start out with toasts and then song and then stories. And it was just all just incredibly joyous. And that was the last time that we were all, we were all here. And it was just, it's, it's a memory etched in my mind. And it was, and again, it was here this place. Mm -hmm. Well, we, we'll take some, have an opportunity for anyone in the audience to ask um, questions of, of Mike, um, but maybe before we turn that over, what, what else would you like us to know about David and, and, and working with, with him? What kind of a person was oh, he? Just, just, I, I, I it, 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 extraordinary, I, I just, it, he, not only was he extraordinary, Rosalie was extraordinary, his family is extraordinary, and he lived an extraordinary life. Um, he did, he, he did what, on a daily basis what he loved, uh, which was writing and, and researching history and talking about history and painting, and uh, he got so much, uh, he got so much joy out of life. I never once saw him down. He was always, first thing in the morning, he was always, he was ready to go. And he was never down. Uh, it was the next, the, you know, what's the next journey? What's the next? Um, and he was, he was a wonderful storyteller. Uh, uh, I, I think back now, some of the times that we were here that at the end of the day we'd go have dinner and we'd sit around and he would just, how lucky I was to be just sitting there and Linda would, was, was, and Anne were all part of this that sometimes he would just stop and just uh, tell stories and they were wonderful and he, as I said, he loved to sing and to tell jokes and his laugh was wonderful, it was, it was great. And he and Rosalie were such a magical, magical couple and so they were so lucky to have each other and have their family. And uh, we're all lucky to have had them in our lives. Well, I bet you think a lot about how fortunate it was that you took the time, you took the risk to write oh. that letter. <laughs> you still have it. I, uh, I, I, or at least his I response, do. right? I, I do, yeah. I do. And, and um, I know it's one of those things where I just, if I hadn't done that, how I, I, I can't even imagine what my, life would have been, mm -hmm. uh, would have been life, but I couldn't have, now in retrospect, I couldn't have imagined a more magical, wonderful life uh, to have had once I got hooked up with mm -hmm. him. Mm -hmm. Well, this has been great, Mike, and I'm sure I've 
I've, I've asked some questions. I'm sure I've missed things here. Um, I want to take an opportunity to give anyone in the audience a chance to, to ask some questions. I think we have a, a mic that we can uh, circulate around and take a few minutes to, to do that. I see two hands in both back corners. Duggar. I can ask my question out loud. Oh, okay. Is, when you do the books, you gather all these wonderful facts and documents and historical characters, but for me, it's the story that brings these books to life. Can you tell us a little bit about how he crafted the stories and how he put the books together and maybe what kind of role you had in that? Um, uh, the latter part of the question, no role. Uh, but on the on the, the the previous part, it's a very very good question. Um, he, uh, as I said, not only was he a great storyteller verbally, but he could convey that on on a page. And I think where that came from was uh, that he he would. This is my own, my own view, he never said this, but this is my own view, is that he approached writing good history, vivid history, as you might write a novel. Um, that, that details, those small details, uh, what was the weather like on a particular day? What was going through the mind of your protagonist or antagonist or whatever? Um, what, did they, what were they dressed like? Um, how did the, I mean, the opening line of, of John Adams is about, David describes Adams on horseback and the, um, and the horse uh, uh, stepping along in the ice, the crusty ice, which sets the stage for this lonely guy who's headed off to Philadelphia in this horrible weather and so forth. So I guess if, if I were to say what, what was that he would, he would look at it as, as a novelist was uh, writing writing history to make it vivid and alive and come alive. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Sure. Hi, um, so I'm actually a historian education major myself and one of my firm beliefs is how that we definitely do need to fix the how history is taught in the education system. And you said how David was also a firm believer in that. And I just wanted to know, like, what were his views on it? Like, how he believed it should be changed and taught? Because I believe it's too sugar-coated and we don't focus on many of the important things. It's mostly just America's involvement instead of maybe other people's involvement. Um, the... <laughs> The second part of your question, I, I don't, Matt and I were talking about this, I don't remember him commenting that much on the latter part of your question. I think what he would, he, what he would talk about is that, that uh, we just need to teach it better. Now, how do you interpret better in, in, um, in lower schools, middle schools, and, and high school? I, 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 I don't know. Um, but he, he also felt that um, by not requiring some kind of history course in colleges and universities was really doing a disservice uh, to, to students because of the importance of it. We were talking a little bit today with some of the history students and so forth about, about that one of the wonderful things about history is, is that uh, having a history background uh, uh, that you can teach you can write, you can write good history, but there's a whole variety of other things you can do with a history degree. You can get into politics. Some of our greatest presidents were, had great historic senses of history and backgrounds in history and so forth. And I think history made them a better leader, a better president and so forth. Um, we've seen in the last several years how history can, can uh, do well in popular culture. I mean, you take the play Hamilton, uh, based on a historical character, the play 1776, and the movie 1776, the John Adams series, the Ken Burns Civil War series. I remember talking to people after that came out who said that they watched that. Uh, they, had no, they had had no interest in the Civil War prior to that. 
but that they watched that and that started to engage them. Um, so I think I think uh, uh, history can as a as a as a background that it it not only can make you a better citizen, but I think you can use it in so many different inter, uh, 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 disciplines, no matter what career you pursue. Okay. It's a quick follow up, though. I'm curious about, especially with regard to the pioneers, um, what the the critics of that book. Um, Pointed out, you know, it's sort of what it, what it what it may have lacked in terms of attention to uh, Native Americans or women or African Americans um, in the Northwest Territory. What what was David's take on on that? Well, that's that's a good question. I, a couple of things uh, that I that I do know is that. Um, uh, when some of that came out, he was he was a little bit he was a little bit bewildered because what some of the people were saying were quotes out of contemporary con contemporaneous documents or letters or diaries or whatever. It wasn't something he was writing. Mm -hmm. It was something that was coming out of a contemporaneous dar a document, which for any historian, primary sources are fair fair game. The other thing, though. Which then, it, it, but he didn't get. I, I have to tell you, he, he 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 wasn't. He didn't get too bothered by it. He just didn't didn't get bothered. But one thing we did find out was the fact that several of the people who criticized him hadn't even read the book. <laughs> and there's a there's a great story that that I heard that he was uh, he was doing a a, uh, a book talk up in I won't mention the city, but he was doing the book talk up in a northern city, and um, somebody got up in the audience during Q&A and held up a copy of the book and started started going after him about, about this particular issue. And finally David said, excuse me, can I ask you a question? And he said, have you read the book? And she said, no. And he said, thank you very much, good night, and walked off the stage and got a standing ovation. <laughs> On uh, June 1st, 2019, the morning after he gave his presentation here, I had a magical moment, uh, my first and only meeting with David McCullough in the lobby of the Lafayette Hotel. Oh, great. And I'll never forget it, uh, I had a chance to meet Rosalie and several family me members who came down, but uh, he was tickled. We sat for about 10 or 15 minutes over coffee. Uh, he was tickled that Marietta had its own historical marker factory and uh, being an out-of-towner, we, uh, myself, we shared our mutual love for the history here and, and the people here. But to my question, uh, and I'll never forget this, he said, if, if I had the energy, I would write a separate book about Dr. Samuel Hildreth. Uh, and I wondered if anyone, uh, such as yourself, may be working on that. <laughs> we tried to pitch it to Mike over dinner. <laughs> In fact, I kind of outlined the book for him. <laughs> I, don't, I don't know. Well, it, it, I, it, I'm so flattered because that was the fifth time that I heard it today about it. About it. Well, as a matter of fact, I, 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 I'm going to look at it I, because I, now I'm, I'm more peaked. But you're, I'm glad that he said that to you because he said that to countless people while he was out here. He was so fascinated by Hildreth, and um, uh, and he he said many many times uh, somebody needs to write a good biography on him. Um, so it's it's out there. Um, uh, I, 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 I'm flattered, and I think it's terrific to take a look at it. So um, uh, stand by. Uh, the other one, the other thing I could just uh, comment too. I'm glad you mentioned that too about running him into the uh, into him at the hotel and all that stuff. He did that everywhere. I mean, he would in the mornings he would go down and sit in the lobbies of hotels and stuff like that. People who would recognize him, they'd come up to him and stuff. And he just loved talking to people. He did it all 
all the time. And, uh, and it, was, it was really one of the wonderful, charming qualities. And so I'm glad you had a chance to experience that. Are any of uh, Mr. McCullough's family members going to follow in his footsteps, or do they have aspirations of such? Um, actually, of his uh, five children, his daughter has written two books, uh, two wonderful books. One is called Posterity, and it's a collection of letters of famous Americans to their children. It's a beautiful book. Every every June, uh, every middle school and high school in the country should should have that uh, required reading for students. It's, it's got beautiful, beautiful advice. And then she also wrote a wonderful, wonderful novel. And then his other son, uh, David McCullough Jr., has also written several, several books. They're both wonderful, wonderful writers. Um, so whatever they do, I hope that they continue doing writing. But yes, the talent has gone down there. Yeah, I uh, wanted to say that it was a great privilege um, both giving you and, and the family and David uh, the tours over at Mount Cemetery. And, and to my great regret, I didn't give the tour initially about Hildreth. Uh, that was something that he discovered. And, and when he came back about the middle of the, the uh, process, he wanted to see and take that tour again and see specifically where Hildreth was. But I distinctly remember that last visit when he was going to be uh, doing the speech that evening and the long schedule he had that entire day, followed by that two hour uh, standing um, on the stage. Uh, when we got to Hildreth, he took over and stood there by his grave uh, to all of our great delight uh, to talk not only about, uh, about his life and his career, but he just lit up, and and I again I want to encourage you to do that as well, uh, <laughs> because it, it really was a magical moment of him relating the story to the family, uh, to his wife and, and children and grand grandchild I believe was there as well. Yeah. Um, but it was it was just a, a magical thing that yeah. that I'll always remember about that uh, particular visit. That was that was a. Really wonderful moments. It didn't. It, was that when we went down to the church too? Yeah, we, we went, went to, to the, the, church. the congregational church yeah. afterwards as well, and, and took yeah. a, a tour of that. And, right. and I will say, um, just the questions that he asked, you could already see him formulating, as you yeah. talked about, yeah. what it looked like, what it smelled like, what it sounded like. Yeah. Uh, so you could already see how that process was yeah. was going to be put onto paper. For you. Sure. Um, Katie. Yes. Hey. Hi. Um, so uh, you've talked a lot about David McCullough's process, and you are, of course, a historian in your own right. And I was interested if you could tell us a little bit about what guides you when you're looking at a project to write about. What are the topics that interest you? They're not exactly the same as the topics that David McCullough was interested in. What's what, what's motivating you when you write a history? Oh, thanks. Thanks for asking. Well, of the three books that I've done. Two of them, well, the first one, the Washburn uh, Diary and Letters, that actually came out of David's Greater Journey book uh, because he used that and the Diary and the Letters to tell the story of, of the American ambassador there during the Franco-Prussian War and the siege in the commune. And, and after that book came out, some reviewers said that they thought those chapters were particularly riveting. So Simon and Schuster, uh, came up with the idea of of having the complete diary and letters and and a profile of Washburn's life issued as a separate book, and um, this shows you again how wonderful he was to me. That Simon Schuster asked him if they thought I would be interested in doing it, and so he called me and he said. Um, would you like to do this? And I said, I had never done a book before, and I said, 
I said, I don't think so because I don't think I can do it. And he said, yes, you can. I know you can do it. And that gave me the confidence to, to uh, undertake it. And then, again, part of his wonderful generosity is that when the book was completed, he offered to do a forward to the book, which of course got him involved in the, in the process. So that was one that just kind of came to me that he was just incredible with. War Poet was, was a book about the, the uh, American uh, poet Alan Seeger, who was killed in World War I, who wrote the I Have a Rendezvous with Death uh, poem. And I had actually been interested in him since I was in high school. I was fascinated by him. Um, and um, uh, I always wanted to do a book. And I tried to get a contract, and nobody would, would uh, bite on it. So I thought, well, and this is part of for aspiring authors, part of what's great about this time now is the fact that I said, well, I'm, I'm just going to go ahead and self-publish it. So I wrote, wrote it, self-published it, and uh, I got a review in the Washington, or the uh, Wall Street Journal. Mm -hmm. and, uh, uh, and then the third book, the Art Buckwald funny business book, uh, what I, I stumbled on it again was that I was at the Library of Congress one day doing some, uh, some research for David, and I ran into one of the archivists that I had known there. And I would always, let's see, what's the word? Terrorize them by <laughs> cornering any time I saw them in the hallway and say, what's new? what do you got? What's new? What new collections are there? So I, I happened to catch one um, unsuspecting archivist. And she said, well, I'm just we're just finishing processing the Art Buckwall papers. So I thought, oh my god, this is, you know. And I asked about the collection. And it's kind of like with Pioneers. How is, how is the paper? Fabulous. The correspondence is great. Um, it, every aspect of his life is, is in there. So I talked to my friend John Meacham, and he was able to get me a contract with Random House to do it. And in the interim, I met with uh, Art Buckwald's son and his mother-in-law, <coughs> Joel and Tamara, about, about that. And they were very, very supportive from the very beginning and have been all along. So that was another one where I just kind of stumbled into it. But then, you know, from, my training with David, you, you, a light goes off in your head, you know, I think there's something here. I think there's a good story here. And then when you find out it's backed up by archival material, then you just start running with it. How about we take, we have one more, one more question. Oh, okay. All right, how about we do one more question and then um, Mike has agreed we uh, have the Betty Cleland room reserved here, right sort of around the, the hallway um, after this portion of the talk uh, is, is concluded. Mike will migrate over there and, and be happy to, anybody wants to meet him or you've got further questions you want to, to ask, he'll, uh, he'll spend some more time over there if you, if you want to hang out for a few more minutes. Hi, Mike. Hi. Uh, um, so the imagine the, the, we're imagining the Hildreth book that's that's coming up. Um, I'm, I'm also I'm sure. wondering. You know what? I hope I, I hope this the stream of YouTube is being piped into every publishing house <laughs> because because by my reckoning we could have a contract signed <laughs> by the time I leave the Marriott tomorrow. But that's. Well, Hildreth aside, uh, I'm wondering, uh, I'm imagining you coming to Marietta for the, the first, your first visit in, in, in the uh, archives there and, and studying up, but uh, what other, but during your time, what other uh, personality or topic uh, do you feel would be a strong offshoot uh, uh, in and of itself? Of the, of, of the pioneer material? Yeah, yes. I don't know, uh, Linda, did you tell me today that there's a new Putnam biography? Almost. Oh, uh, <laughs> okay, okay, good, good, good. That's good news, that's good news. Um, let's see, uh, no one comes to mind besides Hilbert. Um, uh, I don't know. I'd have to think about it. Builder, it is then. Solved. <laughs> 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 
That's great. Well, on that note, uh, Mike, thank you very much. This has been a great, uh, a great evening. Really appreciate your coming to campus again. It's always great to see you and and uh, and, and to talk with you. And and this has been really uh, wonderful. Thank you. Great. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. So like I said, anybody who wants to, to stay, uh, have a chance to talk to, to Mike one-on-one, uh, -on -one.